Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the ASCII webinar on embracing circular economy principles in the Australian supply chain. My name is Heidi Chow. I'm the head of membership and business development for ASCII. Today, we will be exploring the principles and framework of circular economy and the benefits it can bring to businesses and society. We hope that this webinar will provide you with valuable insights and practical guidance on how to embrace circular economy principles in your own supply chain. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, we would like to remind you of a few house rules to ensure everyone has a positive and productive experience. First, if you have any questions or comments, please use the chat feature or Q&A box to share them with the group. And this webinar is being recorded. We will upload the recording to our YouTube channel after the webinar. I appreciate your cooperation and we hope you enjoy the webinar. So now let's start. We are excited to have Ashley Olsen, the founder of Evolvable Consulting as our expert speaker. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Heidi. Um, yeah, really excited today to present on circular economy. So uh, Evolvable Consulting, we support companies in Australia and internationally uh, develop circular economy strategies. So we'll get into it today. Right, I'd like to start with this slide around today's problems are often yesterday's solutions. So I think it's pretty timely given today's state and some of the, the issues and problems we're facing, not only in Australia, but from a global perspective, um, has been framed as a bit of a poly crisis. And a lot of the issues we're dealing with are interconnected, such as climate change and impacts on biodiversity. Um, and these are coming out of decisions that were made in the past, essentially. So the circular economy is one way to address a number of these interconnected issues. So it's always good to reflect on the current state of the economy. The linear economy is really a one-way street. So we take resources via extraction, we make them into, manuf um, into products or so manufacture them into products. We distribute, uh, distribute them, use them, and then obviously dispose of them. So as part of this process, we're losing value along the way. And to provide some additional context, so this has been the global material consumption um, from the last 30, 40, uh, nearly 50 years now. So you can see this isn't a sustainable um, pathway in terms of our global consumption rate. So last year we um, tipped over 100 gigatons of consumption um, and you can see it's exponentially increasing. So um, the actual rate of consumption is estimated to be around 1.6 planets annually. Um, so as you can see, it's not sustainable and there's a number of other graphs from an environmental perspective, such as climate change, which had this similar exponential curve so it gives you insights into the issues um, that we're facing. So in terms of linear value chains, there's a number of efficiencies, um, inefficiencies associated with, them, associated with them. So as you can see, we've got the various stages that we went through earlier in terms of product design, sourcing, manufacturing, logistics, marketing, um, sales, product use. And I guess along that value chain, um, the inefficiencies are clumped into sort of four key areas. Uh, the first one being unsustainable materials. So material and energy that cannot be continually regenerated. So obviously there's a big push on the energy transition at the moment, but even if we shifted to 100% renewables, it only addresses 50% of the climate change issue. Uh, the bulk of the other uh, or the other the the other transition that we need to address is a material transition um, and that's starting to look at more renewable and bio-based products essentially underutilized capacities and underused assets so a lot of um, operational equipment for example uh, sit there idle and like a personal car is a classic example it sits idle for sort of 90 percent of the time Premature product life, so products are not used to their fullest um, from a possible working life perspective. 
uh, we've got a really sort of consumerism approach to society. So um, fast fashion is a classic example of that, where there's really high churn on products when they can actually last a lot longer. Um, and then there's wasted end of life value. So in terms of um, components and just materials and energy that are embedded within products, um, they're not being recovered uh, and repurposed to their full extent. Obviously, recycling is a key component of that. Um, and across this whole value chain, I guess, is um, unexploited customer engagement. So uh, we're really focused on selling functionality of a product rather than the customer problem. And that's one piece that the circular economy tries to um, address, essentially, through different business, business models. So Alan MacArthur Foundation is a really uh, strong voice from a circular economy perspective, and they've got this really neat diagram called the butterfly diagram. So on one side, you've got the natural um, cycle of materials and products, and on the, on the other side, you've got the technical side. So you can see the, uh, I guess, products um, come through from the top. So you've got the finite materials, whether they're sort of or um, mined ores, for example, and then you've got renewables on the um, on the left hand side, and these uh, go through the value chain essentially in terms of getting developed into products, um, and then obviously uh, consumers use like the use phase. And what the circular economy tries to do is develop these circles um, and they've got, they expand out and this is sort of your hierarchy, which we'll get into in further detail um, in future slides. But the closer the circle or the smaller the circle, the higher level of circular economy essentially. So you can see on the technical side, um, recycling is really your last line of defence from a circular economy perspective. Um, and I always class that similar to offsets from a decarbonisation perspective. You want to do everything you possibly be, uh, can before you utilise that as your last line of defence. Um, and in Australia, there's a really strong focus on um, waste and recycling. And the problem with that is you actually lock in and encourage waste. Um, so working on some uh, various working groups at a sort of national level at the moment, we're trying to shift that focus from being called waste to um, resources and uh, getting people to understand the value in those to try and bring them down this um, tighten the circles essentially from a material perspective. And it's the same on the natural side. So obviously looking at various... Um, various initiatives from a, a biological perspective um, to tighten the circles there to create and encourage more um, bio-based products and the likes of that. So alternative products instead of utilising finite resources. Um, and the whole goal is to minimise this uh, leakage and negative externalities. And obviously with each of these, there's various environmental and social impacts um, that support them. So jumping on to the three core principles of the circular economy, we're really aiming to design out waste and pollution. So this comes back to that point that I was previously making around um, not trying to lock in waste. What we're trying to actually do is eliminate waste altogether. Um, the next piece there is keeping products and materials in use at their highest value. So we'll get into that in the next stage. So it's really, as you cascade down the technical cycle, your product loses value essentially. Um, so you want to try and keep it in as tight a circle as possible. And then the last goal there is, or principle is really regenerate natural um, ecosystems. So with a focus on um, increasing biodiversity, so you're not having that negative environmental impact. So what the circular economy is not is really um, really a bug there that we always come up against in this industry. So it's not about recycling. As you can see from that butterfly diagram, there's a lot more to it. It's not like in companies we come into, they always default to waste. And it's not about retitling or rebranding a waste management plan. It actually fundamentally links into your business strategy, similar to sustainability. It needs to be 
integrate it as part of that. If it's not, it's just going to fall over. Um, it's not just about materials, the circular economy. Um, there's societal impacts and obviously the environmental impacts that come with it. And we're not aiming for 100% circles. We're aiming to increase the level of circularity. So at the moment, the global material um, circularity is estimated to be 7.2% for um, 2022. And that's been a decreasing trajectory essentially. So our aim is to increase circularity, but to get to 100% circularity is a really, um, I guess, aspirational goal. Um, some companies though, which we'll get onto some case studies later, have set these targets now. So um, we'll jump into that in a little bit. So in terms of the state of the circular economy in Australia, it's rapidly um, escalating essentially. So the, a number of regions around the world are far more advanced. So the Nordic and EU regions. Um, so I'm lucky enough to do a fair bit of work in those sort of areas, but also support a number of the keys sort of national um, uh, groups, I guess. So there's just recently, um, late last year or early this year, there was a circular economy expert advisory group set up, which reports directly to the Minister for Environment. Um, so this is uh, develop, uh, this is uh, consists of a range of uh, associations and expertise, for example. So, for example, I support Engineers Australia um, uh, that reports into this group, and they're really trying to frame up around developing those key levers and messaging of what we really need to chase from a national perspective um, and also policy and legislation to enact the circular economy within Australia. There's a circular economy, Australian circular circular economy hub, which is led up by Planet Arc. Um, so that's something anyone can go on and join. And uh, there's, a, there's a wealth of sustain, uh, circular economy practitioners um, on that uh, forum essentially. And there's a lot of really valuable uh, information there. Circular, circular Australia is a not-for-profit that's been set up um, based out of New South Wales. But I've got some really leading um, people on there to help accelerate some of the uh, circular economy sort of policy and guidance within Australia. Um, and both of these um, groups support the expert advisory um, panel as well. Research and development, there's so like, there's a wealth of um, research from unis and the likes of that being undertaken at the moment. Um, and there's a couple of CRCs uh, in the works as well from a circular economy perspective, just to help Australia leverage the opportunity um, because it addresses a number of uh, key issues that Australia is dealing with, such as um, climate change and biodiversity crises. And then standards Australia as well. Um, so from an international perspective, so ISO standards are developing a circular economy um, standard at present. Um, and Standards Australia is supporting that work and then they'll do an overlay or understand how that will translate to Australia essentially. So I also support Standards Australia from that perspective. Um, so there's a lot going on and we're really trying to leverage a lot of um, the learnings from overseas countries. Um, so a lot of these groups have got partnerships with um, like associations in the EU. <coughs> sorry, that have been through this process and we're really trying to accelerate our uh, Australia's journey through leveraging those experiences. So now getting on to circular supply chains and how they might differ from your traditional supply chain. So there's really four key um, areas that I see where they differ. So we're really trying to reduce and maximise resources. So you're trying to shorten supply chains and we look to repair more than what we build. So obviously there's like the National um, Reconstruction Fund and the likes of that that are really trying to put a drive on manufacturing in Australia. So this will help to shorten supply chains rather than being really dependent on overseas and the logistics and constraints that come with that. 
there's a secondary and renewable input. So changing where you're actually sourcing your materials and what those materials look like, um, generating only value streams. So it's really a mindset shift around um, the consideration of waste and looking how you can uh, value and monetize that um, and eliminating waste streams essentially. Um, and then interconnected systems. So we talk about, everyone talks about collaboration, but Australia is really like acts in silos and is really competitive to a lot of the international um, countries. So it's trying to break those down and really uh, create the right connections needed um, where we do share uh, sort of materials and data and the likes of that to accelerate um, these ecosystems essentially where the value is kept within them rather than passing through them. So I came across this um, definition for circular supply chains. So they're really aiming to reduce and maximise resource use by using secondary and renewable inputs to generate value through interconnected systems, which really summarises those four um, aspects that I spoke to previously. So getting to the, I guess, the real root cause of um, working towards a circular economy, uh, circular, circular ecosystem, is addressing it in a design phase. Um, so design, of, I'm an engineer, so I've had the um, privilege of being able to see how much influence you have in the engineering phase of a, um, of a product, for example, or a project. And it's really engineering 101 and, um, and it's about value creation or value engineering. So greater than 80% of the environmental and social impacts are decided in the concept or feasibility phase of a product um, or a project, for example. Um, so it's really trying to identify the key levers in that real early phase where you can uh, mitigate uh, environmental and social impacts and integrate those into your design specs, for example. And you do you can do this at the least cost um, as early as possible in the engineering phase. Obviously, as you get through design, um, your level of influence becomes reduced and the cost of making changes increases. Um, so you're really trying to maximise and think, have that life cycle thinking approach. Um, as early on in, in the uh, sort of design of a product or project as you can essentially. And you can see this shift is happening um, globally. So there's a number of sort of projects, whether it's mobile phones like Fairphone is a real uh, classic example where they've shifted to a real modular um, phone design and now Apple, uh, which we'll touch on later, but also Nokia, fundamentally designing their phones um, differently so they can extend the product life of them but also recover the materials out a lot easier. Obviously renewable developments is an escalation in those um, like being developed at the moment uh, in terms of the projects so designing those with sort of life extension and modularity in mind. Um, there's footwear like fashion, for example, is uh, being fundamentally being designed different with more renewable and bio-based materials. Um, obviously, heavy industry sort of industrial symbiosis is a classic example there. Um, and then cars is a um, great example around how the automotive industry is shifting in this space. And we'll touch on Volvo um, just as a case study later on. They're fundamentally changing their design of their um, car. So this is a great um, example. It's called the Value Hill Pyramid, essentially, and it looks at the value chain and that circular design perspective. So obviously, as you move up the value hill um, or up the value chain, incrementally adding um, value to a to a product. So it depends on where you sit in that value chain, whether you're at the early end from a mining perspective or you're a manufacturer, um, your level of value that you add to a product differs. Um, so as you increase up this value hill, you're adding incremental value um, until you're at a point that you can sell it and it's being um, 
in the use phase by kids consumer essentially and then as you as like the product has been used um you this is where i guess the linear model from a disposal perspective comes in so you've got all these different levers from a circular economy perspective that tries to keep as much value as possible um, as high in the value hill periods pyramid so you've got repair and maintain obviously uh, maintains the highest value and this comes back to that core principle number two um, from from a circular economy perspective as you decrease down the value hill you're losing um, product value essentially so and it's harder to recover so you got to put more energy and time into it and your recovery of materials decreases so you're losing value in order to create like a new secondary product essentially as you decrease um, down this and as you can see recycling's that last sort of line of defense and then obviously you've got the waste comp like residual waste component that comes out of it and is essentially wasted value so we'll touch on these in a little bit uh, more detail but crux of this is you want to keep your product as high in that value hill as, um, as possible to maintain the value and so this is a neat it's called the r ladder um, a neat summary of sort of that technical cascade around um, different, uh, I guess, strategies, circular economy strategies. So the higher up this um, R ladder you are, the higher level of circularity is a crux of it. And in terms of those circles that we saw in the butterfly diagram at the start, um, you can sort of see how they link to this. So I've tried to sort of group, map them into groups. And so at the high end, you're really narrowing the loop. Um, in terms of minimising the use of resources. In the middle there, which is obviously a big chunk, um, you're slowing those loops down. So you're maintaining those solutions at their highest value or as high as possible. Obviously, they decrease as you sort of go down that technical cascade. Um, and then obviously recycling and recovery, you're um, closing the loop. Obviously, it's at the lower end of circularity. So you've lost a bit of value, but... You're looking to um, utilize those materials again and create further value from them. So this is always a good um, when you're assessing like a product, uh, yeah, product or a project, understanding where it fits into this and what sort of uh, business methodology or business strategy you could leverage as high up this pyramid or this ladder as possible to maintain the highest level of value. And then this is just really translating it to um, like a comparison, I guess, around you've got the linear, traditional linear um, economy model at the top, take, make, waste or disposal. And then you've got the circular economy overlay of those sort of R ladders and that value hill pyramid and how it relates to the value chain. Um, because they keep, they, I guess, inject back in at different um, aspects of the, value chain so you can see like maintain and repair is really um that that closest and tightest loop um you've got refurbish and redistribute comes back and kicks into the value chain um, prior to retailers um, you've got remanufacturing components and reuse which comes back into that sort of product manufacturing piece and then recycling um obviously coming back in uh, towards in between that material and component manufacturing and obviously the further back you come in the value chain the more sort of energy and additional impact you're going to have in terms of um, developing a new product associated with them so it's keeping that in mind as well and hopefully the residual component coming out like in terms of waste that percentage is minimized So onto a couple of case studies here. So Caterpillar, um, 
hopefully the majority of people are sort of familiar with Caterpillar. So they're actually really advanced in the circular economy space. So they've had this um, program called CAT re or Reman or Remanufacturing Program. They've had it for um, a number of years actually. And you can see here their whole um, basis for it is um, providing customer, customers with lower cost products, shorter downtime and quick dependable service options. Um, and through this process, they reduce waste, lower greenhouse gas emissions, and ultimately they're reducing their um, dependence on raw materials and virgin materials. So essentially what is in their supply chain is becoming their future um, their future supply chain essentially. So is, is their future um, bank of materials. So so this is this is straight from their website. It's around ensuring maximum productivity, increasing reliability and equipment uptime, ensuring cost-effective performance and receiving a like new warranty. Um, so there's there's a wealth of benefits that they've identified um, through implementing this remanufacturing program. And this is a great example of how sort of major companies are doing this globally across. Um, their value chains essentially um, and the other one with this was around I guess one thing to be conscious of in the circular economy is around they call them sort of rebound effects so it's associated with if you're getting products back um, from um, clients or consumers the reverse logistics side of it um, so we've worked with a couple of customers that really have um, distributed um, value chains essentially. And the, re the emissions associated with reverse logistics can be significant. So it's really around trying to, if you're looking at sort of a, um, like a remanufacturing process like this, you have to look at how you can make that reverse logistics side and that consolidation of materials um, as efficient as possible, essentially. Right. Um, another one is sort of Wartzilla. So they make um, sort of energy uh, equipment, essentially. So they develop one of their engines, which they're expanding to other engines now, a real modular design. So obviously this comes back to that design piece. Um, and as part of that, it allows sort of standardization and component um, commonality and flexibility um, to really make it simple to change these things out in the field to minimize that downtime and serviceability. Um, so what they I, like the benefits that they achieved out of this were 45% um, reduction in production development expenses, uh, lower costs from ongoing product care. So obviously with various circular economy strategies, um, you might have a higher level of maintenance or sort of warranty service um, to maintain a sort of product or components that we're quicker, um, like in order to support that. And then obviously 50% reduction in assembly time um, using more sort of modular um, engine architecture. So there's some real classic examples like the 3D printing um, space is really changing this game in terms of allowing um, manufacturers or OEMs to really just um, design for modularity and they're able to actually print products in the field um, that are required. So that's another case study, so just conscious of time. Um, so obviously onto circular sourcing is a massive piece of this. So where do you get your materials from? Um, so I guess you need to know how, um, obviously design will set what materials you need. Um, obviously you'd have your traditional materials, but I guess in terms of looking for secondary materials or recycled materials, there's obviously that quality piece that you need to um, you need to sort of take and understand. So in the EU, there's actually um, mandates now on levels of recycled content in products and design. So um, I guess value chains are working with material recovery providers 
to understand the materials that they're recovering, what sort of quality are they and how they can work towards achieving high quality products. Um, so they can just get put directly straight back into the um, value chain. Um, and that's where design is coming into play. So design of certain products, obviously in the past have been had really mixed metals and the likes of that. So um, companies are starting to design products and sort of tag them so they know exactly what type of, say, metal it is. So you can recover it with as high efficiency as possible at um, as lower energy requirement as possible, essentially. The more commingled things are, the more energy intensive and resource intensive it is to recover products. Um, procurement processes, obviously integrating these requirements into um, your RFPs and your code of conduct and setting sort of KPIs um, that come with it. Um, and we've got a sort of slide on this next. Um, and I think uh, like a supplier engagement is obviously a massive one across the value chain. So this is a big piece in the scope three space as well. Um, really sort of engaging with your suppliers and understanding what they're trying to do and how you can benefit each other, um, and whether it's partnerships or collaborations to shift towards um, more circular business models. And then obviously sourcing circular, um, you need the, the infrastructure and that really uh, material processing piece to understand it. There might be existing um, product streams that you can just take straight um, into your product designs, which like industrial symbiosis is a classic piece on that. There's various resource marketplaces coming up. Um, I guess companies are taking stakes in both mining like either, at either end of the value chain, so either mining or sort of waste resource recovery companies now because they see the benefits in it in terms of becoming more circular. And then there's obviously um, supporting metrics that come with it, um, uh, depending on the business model that you choose, whether it's sort of product as a service um, or recycling and sort of product life extension. So there's actually, um, the Australian government has a sustainable procurement guide. So this is obviously for government entities, but there's actually a lot of circular economy guidance within this. So if you look to like flick to um, page one or two um, of this, it's just got a classic circular economy diagram. The benefit of this guide is that it actually provides you with um, in, uh, sort of example uh, clauses, contract clauses. Um, they can put into tenders and that to specify um, circular economy uh, sort of initiatives and requirements and also emissions um, requirements. So, yeah, this is a really good um, reference. Obviously, yeah, there's a sustainable procurement guide and there's a whole web page on this which has a heap of supporting guidance as well. When you're getting down to a more granular level around types of products, these are a bit um, grainy, but you can look into um, whether a product has an environmental product declaration, which requires like a life cycle assessment to be completed. So you understand all the impacts of the, um, of the product, like environmental impacts associated with it. In the EU and from this ISO standard that's getting developed, uh, there's a thing coming out called product circularity data sheets. And that's really shifting to document the circularity of products. And that's got a range of um, metrics and parameters required to input to that. Um, and it requires like value chain collaboration and input in order to develop those product sheets. And then there's a range of other sort of environmental labels out there like um, Geeka or compostable green tag or energy rating or water rating, for example, um, that contain and provide environmental um, related information that you can use to support decision making. Um, there's various sort of resource exchange platforms popping up. So obviously um, the secondary material market is going to increase with a shift to a circular economy. Um, so these market, or not so much marketplaces, but resource exchange um, platforms are trying to make those secondary material um, and resource 
uh, streams visible um, to the various ecosystems because like today Australia's um, failed in a lot of places because there hasn't been the scale and the demand side for products essentially so um, platforms such as a surplus are really trying to make these uh, product streams or material streams visible at scale so they can become commercial. And then I guess moving on to data. So data for circularity is going to be critical, um, a critical enabler essentially. Um, without measuring it, you can't fix it. You don't have visibility of the various streams. So there's a big shift in terms of standardization um, in that from an Australian perspective at the moment to see how we can better do this. Um, and that's where the likes of product environmental uh, circular, circularity data sheets will assist in containing some of that data. In terms of um, global material flows, uh, this was developed uh, back in 2021 around global material flows. And this is where they had identified that global circularity was around 8.6%. And this has decreased now to 7.2% as of um, for 2022. Um, and so this is a good indication of obviously your minerals, your ores, your fossil fuels, your biomass, how they're distributed across the economy, um, global economy essentially, and which portions are then recycled and recovered um, for input back into the economy essentially. So. We're aiming to increase that to reduce our dependence on virgin materials um, is the crux or not of it. So the more data we can get, the better. And there's various um, ways we can access this data. So industry four is going to be a game changer in this space. And you're already seeing it in terms of supply chain traceability that we'll touch on. Um, so obviously um, blockchain and RFID and QR codes, IoT, and even AI now are enabling this data and visibility of data to, um, to understand further the flows um, through these global uh, value chains, essentially, um, material flows and the likes of that. And it'll help us to understand the best ways to, um, to recover and inject those back into the value chain to reduce that reliance on virgin materials. So in terms of what data is enabling, it's enabling that demand side, it is, it's enabling that tracking and tracing of materials, the visibility and scale of those secondary resource streams, um, obviously that connection and collaboration um, across value chains and also decision-making um, in terms of this, uh, in terms of uh, accelerating a circular economy. So supply chain traceability is becoming massive. So I've been lucky to work with a number of um, supply chain traceability companies um, overseas, working across various industrial supply chains. Um, so in terms of, so it's going to be skewy, but in terms of supply chain um, provenance and guarantee of origin schemes, it's popping up across so many different sectors now. We've just jotted a couple of them down here. And this is really where um, materials are being traced across the whole product um, life cycle. And now doing this provides the opportunity to trace um, these characteristics through the use phase and then that material recovery, like that end of life stage to really enable and enact that um, circular economy piece to start to um, close those loops essentially and tighten those um, circles up. So one of the companies I've worked with um, does material supply chain traceability for um, uh, in automotive value chains and also plastic um, and sort of heavy industry value chains. Volvo and Polestar are one of their um, customers. I've been lucky enough to work with them. And Volvo has moved past um, decarbonisation targets and have set a 100% circular um, target by 2040. 
um, which is massive. And they've identified the uh, the savings, even just in the near term out to 2025, around both cost savings and um, reducing emissions. But what they're doing is uh, this is translating to how they're fundamentally designing their cars, which I've touched on previously, around designing them so they're easily um, dismantable, um, so designing for, um, I guess, disassembly. And then like the material components like the chassis, obviously um, having less mixed uh, metals and um, enabling it so they can be recovered at as high a percentage as possible, but also more modular design as well. Um, Apple is another classic one. So you see they've got like buyback schemes. If you take your phone back, um, they'll give you some uh, discounted a discount on your new phone essentially. They're also in the US and Nokia as well, um, introducing sort of lease models. And so what iPhone or Apple do with these um, phones, they've got robots that automatically dismantle them. They've got names like Daisy and that. Um, there's a couple of different types, but essentially they put the phone on a conveyor belt and then the robots will just pluck them apart and recover as um, as many materials as they can. So they see that their, um, their bank of materials is actually out with consumers at the moment. Um, so that's their future supply chain that they're trying to um, secure to reduce that reliance on virgin materials. And then lastly, like I've mentioned a couple of times, collaboration across the value chain is going to be um, key to enabling circular economy. So really breaking down those barriers and seeing that um, partnerships across the value chain are critical to unlocking um, these circular the circular economy, but also address those other issues around um, climate change and biodiversity and social societal um, issues, essentially. So I pulled together some good resources um, that you can go and check out. So you've got the Australian Circular Economy Hub, um, the ACE Hub, you can jump on, sign up to that, and there's a wealth of forums, but also information there. The sustainable procurement guideline um, and guidance online from the government. You've got this is an international circular supply chain network. So they've got a wealth of info on there um, on that website that you can leverage and tap into forums as well. Alan MacArthur Foundation has some really great um, information and sort of toolkits on their website. And lastly, the circular procurement in eight steps. Um, this ebook is really, um, it's really, I guess, lays out some fundamentals that you can go in and use as a bit of a Bible, essentially, in helping you uh, make decisions from a circular procurement perspective. So that sort of wraps it up right on time. So I guess the question's over to you around what steps will you take to become more circular now? Um, and yeah, obviously these are my details. Feel free to uh, reach out to you can reach out to us, and happy to take any questions now. So I've done enough talking. Um, yeah, happy for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, there is a question from the audience asking if they can get a copy of your presentation. <laughs> yep. Yeah, sure. happy. Happy mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, um, so what we'll do is um, I will get a copy um, from Ashley and I will email to you all uh, with the webinar recording link so you have both the recording and also the presentation. Any other questions? My questions. I think like one of the key things working with a lot of companies, both in Australia and um, internationally, is really sort of breaking down those silos internally. So we talk to a lot of companies and we do sort of stakeholder interviews across the company and there's always a lot of disconnects um, between what the company is actually sort of trying to achieve, particularly in the circular economy space. And it's one of the key things is that everyone needs to be... Um, 
like a line to pull a circular economy strategy off essentially. So it needs to be integrated into your business, um, your, your core business strategy essentially. It can't be an add-on similar to sustainability. We do um, decarbonisation and sustainability strategies. Um, if they're not integrated into core sort of business, they'll just fall over. All right, so there's a couple of questions. How much do you see companies collaborating on this topic? Um, yeah, so this is rapidly changing in the EU uh, massively. So I've attended like a number of round tables where companies are um, a lot more open over there. Australia companies, now that they're starting to see the opportunity, um, are becoming more open. But there's still a lot of sort of competitiveness there, which we're trying to break down. Um, one of the things is the scope three emissions is, as I see, um, is always a key sort of enabler because people start to understand where their hotspots hot spots are in their supply chain, understand who they actually have influence over and their key stakeholders. Um, and then they're wanting to get more control of that supply chain, essentially. And that's what's really starting to unlock the circular economy discussions across uh, value chain participants. So that's that one. If we're starting on our journey in circular economy and sustainability, top things we need to look at. Yeah, so I guess um, we do gap analysis and it really depends on um, what industry your company sits in and where you sit in that value chain um, to understand sort of your material uh, areas of impact and issues essentially. Um, from there, we delve down into providing sort of strategies around then you can um, unlock them. But it's really like your emissions is obviously a key one to start with, understanding your material flows through company and waste from a like, circular economy perspective provides you sort of key initial um, insights. It's just trying to understand where you're actually losing value today. Um, so like we... A lot of times we'll quantify um, how much company, how much value a company is losing um, in their value chain. And often that's like one of the key metrics that gets their sort of eyes open and gets some action, um, action going from that space. Yeah, basic KPIs we can set to measure success. So there's um, some really good indicators. It's called the circular transition indicators. Um, I didn't actually touch on them here, but they provide some really good um, metrics, uh, like simplified metrics, I guess, um, from a circular economy perspective. So it's really looking at your company's inflow and outflow of materials. Um, they also do sort of water, um, water metrics as well. So I can add that to my slide deck prior to um, prior to sending out. But yeah, it's really understanding like the the inflows and outflows from your company, whether it's at a product or at a corporate level, and understanding where you where your key levers are in terms of um, starting to look at different business models. Obviously, whether you're looking at more sort of leasing or product as a service models, or if you're looking at sort of buyback and um, or repair and manufacture, for example. So yeah, you sort of need to dig into that um, a bit before you can look at which um, strategy best suits your company, um, depending on the industrial sector that you're, that you're involved in. So. I guess one of the, I can add, well, there's no other questions, but one of the other ones is that the circular economy, um, like it depends where people are on their sustainability journey. So the circular economy would be one portion of your sustainability um, aspects because sustainability is um, really holistic. Um, so I guess it, you, you capture it as part of that. Um Yeah, so that, that would be that. And it helps you to address decarbonisation and other environmental aspects which drop out of sustainability, essentially. It helps you to accelerate that. So the earlier you get onto it, the better. 
Um, and obviously uh, looking at your value chain as a whole um, and who you can start to collaborate with. Any more questions? I think um, these are the questions, but um, you all have um, Ashley's contact information, as you can see from the screen here. Um, so please feel free to contact him um, afterwards if you have any questions. Um, and thank you so much for joining us um, in this webinar. And thanks, Ashley, for the great presentation. I hope you find the information shared today useful and insightful. And remember to apply the knowledge gained in your work and share it with the others. The webinar recording will be shared with you and upload to our Ask YouTube channel in a few days. And we will also share today's presentation PDF with you. Don't forget to check out our website for more resources and upcoming events. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.